So here we are in Microsoft Flight Simulator to check out another new release and this is uh, a bit of an unusual one this time, a Doran AR1 from developer Real Physics, and this is uh, is quite inexpensive. I'll put a link in the description below where you can get this thing, uh, it's from Sim Market, where it is uh, 14 euros and 40 cents which equates to about 12 pounds sterling or you know, that's going to be about 16 dollars um i will point out here uh, on this occasion though that uh, this is a review copy that uh, the developer very very kindly sent me so uh, thank you very much to real physics for uh, sending me this review copy uh, although they did miss out because i was considering buying it at the time that they got in touch with me <laughs> now as you can see it's a world war one biplane and a little bit of an unusual one dating from uh, I think its first flight was in 1916 um, and it was getting a little bit obsolete by 1917 like a lot of World War One biplanes um, where they were they were sort of like very very quickly sort of like put out of date by newer developments and stuff like that that now I'm a bit of a World War One buff and so I had vaguely heard of this aeroplane but only um, through reading uh, sort of like one or two sort of slightly obscure biographies and what have you. Now, so this uh, this aircraft, the uh, Doran AR1, was made by what was essentially the um, the sort of French Army's official factory. But it was designed by a couple of guys. One of uh, whom was uh, his surname was uh, Doran, so uh, that's where the name comes from. Uh, essentially, the factory that built built this was the same as the. The, the, it was kind of like the French equivalent of the Royal Aero factory that uh, that built the SE5 in Britain and stuff like that. So this was a French reconnaissance biplane, and the French used it. Uh, they designed it to be a replacement for the farm and pusher aeroplanes that they'd been using prior to that. Uh, so yeah, it was the French Air Force that used it initially, and then when the American Expeditionary Force was um, involved, uh, was getting involved in World War One. They were sort of fairly desperate for aeroplanes, so they inherited a lot of the these that the French had been using. And they, yeah, as you can imagine, uh, the the fact that the French gave them to the Americans uh, was because they um, they weren't that impressed with them, to be honest. I mean, it's a it's a good aeroplane, but um, it had been superseded by other aeroplanes by that point. And in fact, the American uh, Expeditionary Force tended to only use it to sort of get their their pilots used to things in the European theatre and then they uh, they they quickly replaced it with um, slightly more capable aircraft like the uh, Samson 1 and Samson 2 and stuff. So not the best aeroplane in the world but not a terrible aeroplane but very very well built um, as evidenced by the fact that um, even after the First World War ended, a lot of these went onto the civilian register in France and were used well into the sort of mid 1920s as um, training and pleasure flight planes and um, for flying passengers about and stuff like that. So uh, that gives you an ind indication of how well the things were built. I think, I think in total there were um, there were about. 140 or something of these things built so not a vast amount in comparison to some first world war biplanes and there, there were sort of two versions of it there was the um the ar1 and then there was the the ar2 and, and the, obviously the ar2 was a slightly sort of different version of it with a, a different engine and what have you but what we've got here is the ar1 the, if you're curious about the name duran obviously was the uh, one of the the designers of the thing and uh, one of the directors of the uh, the factory that built it so uh, it was his privilege to get the thing named after him the a in ar1 uh, refers to it being a reconnaissance plane and the r refers to it having a renault engine the uh, i think the ar2 had a slightly different engine in it i'm not sure what what engine was in that but this one had a renault engine which is fully modeled on this by the way um you you you'll have to sort of like look through the grills on the side uh, of the airplane to actually be able to see them but the engine is actually in there which is kind of interesting so you can see that this thing is um is a little bit unusual for um for 
First World War biplanes, notably that uh, the fuselage is set off from the the wing. There there were a couple of uh, couple of airplanes that sort of like tried that kind of thing, like the Bristol F two B and things like that. Um, and obviously the advantage of that is that it gives you more lifting surface on the wing. The other thing that's uh, that's interesting about this. Um, is that it, the um, the upper wing is staggered backwards a bit like a sort of Beechcraft stagger wing, uh, if you're familiar with that thing. So um, you know a lot of the time that can look a little bit weird on uh, on aeroplanes. Uh, the 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 reason for it is mainly that they wanted to give uh, the pilot a better view upwards. There were other reasons. Sometimes you know there'd be a better aerodynamic clearance of the down thrust from the upper wing if they shoved it back a little bit and stuff like that. Uh, there are a few reasons for it. I think the uh, I think another one that used it was the sort with Dolphin, if, if I remember rightly. Um, but you know, never the most popular layout to have a sort of backward staggered wing, probably for sort of bracing against the airflow reasons and stuff like that. But I, I think it actually looks quite nice on this plane. It's uh, it's one of the better looking sort of backward staggered planes, and uh, it's quite sleek looking as well. Um, so quite nice. Now, um, as far as the package is concerned, you get, I think, seven paint jobs in the package. You get all of the military users, with the exception of one military user, which was a bit of an obscure one, because this was used by the French Air Force. So you get a French Air Force paint job. Um, it was used by the American Expeditionary Force. Uh, so you get... Uh, an American Expeditionary Force paint job. Um, it was used by the Serbian Air Force, which is the um, paint job that you see here. Although obviously I've added my registration to the thing uh, in the same option screen. And uh, the um, Hellenic, the uh, the Greek Air Force used it as well. The only other force that actually used it was there were some of these that had originally belonged to the French that were in Morocco, uh, and there was a bit of a a bit of a coup there very briefly with them declaring independence uh, and they, the, as the RIF um, and they used them very very briefly um, but there were a lot of uh, lot of civilian versions of, of this this plane used in France after the First World War so you get a few paint jobs of that so there's a red one and a blue one and what the developer has done it which is kind of interesting is rather than simply changing the livery on the thing and leaving all the rest of the stuff the same on all the paint jobs what you find is that the um, the wood textures and the metal textures on the cowling are different on all the paint jobs which is kind of interesting so you get different wood grain on on the different propellers and you get different metal textures on the cowling and you get different textures in the cockpit and stuff like that so they've not just done a sort of lazy copy and paste job on the textures there's quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of variety on the on the cockpits now let's have a little bit of a closer look at the thing um, so I can give you an idea of that so if we put it on this view here which is the drone camera view you can see that um, when you get pretty close um, these textures they're not going to be to everyone's liking uh, I think some of the textures on this are going to be kind of a bit you know you either love them or you hate them but what you can see is that they certainly got a lot of detail on them so you know if we look here you can see that there's kind of like a galvanized metal texture on the engine cowling uh, and then you've got that that wood grain on there yeah i'm pretty sure that a propeller in real life would have a bit straighter wood grain than that but you know a uh, bit of artistic license going on with it and then what you've got um if i swing the view around a little bit here is you've got a bit of a sort of canvas texture going on on the on the wings perhaps a little bit you know of a heavy treatment and a little bit you know sort of on the large scale side for it but definitely gives it some character um when you're viewing it from a distance if i sort of move the view out there um it definitely gives it a little bit of a character um so generally speaking there you are you can see see the uh, the engine detail in there generally speaking this is very nice and it's got some nice uh, nice sort of effects features on it uh, one of which is you can see that there's an exhaust there that has a very very long pi pipe off it and what have you and there's a really nice heat effect that we'll see off that that you, you can see from the cockpit when you're flying the thing along which is kind of interesting so generally speaking i think the model is quite nice on this now i'm going to come off that that drone view uh and and switch back to this view so that we can swing the thing around and have a bit of a look at it and as you can see this is the uh, the serbian air force 
texture um so it's got their uh insignia on the back i'm not the world's expert on the um doran ar1 but what i do know about it is that it did indeed have um a uh, defensive machine gun mounted in the rear cockpit but i know that it also had a forward firing machine gun now i'm not sure where the, the machine gun was mounted on this um, for the forward firing installation. I would guess that it would be on the cowling there in between the V of the engines because the uh, the uh, the engine on this, the Renault engine on this was a about 200 horsepower V8. So there'd be two rows of four cylinders, which means that the gun would be able, probably be able to slot in between the Vs. So you, you could either mount it there or, or up on the cowling, providing that you had some synchronizer gear to allow it to fire through uh, fire through the propeller out which i'm presuming they must have had um since this first flew in 1916 and went in to main service in 1917 by which time the allied forces definitely had synchronizer gear um available so um, i'm assuming that uh they've just emitted the gun now as far as the textures on this go they might be a little bit clean for some people's taste as i say um i think the texturing on this is going to be one of those that you either love or hate i think um a lot of the the texturing of the struts and stuff like that i think is really really nice i'm not in love with every texture that they've picked for the um for the engine cowling this one i quite like um but as i say they're all different you'll you'll certainly find one that you like out of all of them um the um the american expeditionary force one is a, has a very very polished lower lower cowling the french one has a very battered looking almost rusty cowling on it um so you know you've got a lot of options on it but when it comes to the interior which we're going to look at in a second in fact we'll look at it now um what you find is a very very modern interior so what i would tend to view this as is i would say this is more like a modern replica of this airplane than a, a sort of vintage airplane because of the avionics on it if you if you went to air shows a few years ago uh, you might know that there was a there was a vickers vimy replica that used to do the rounds on air shows that was a similar sort of thing it had been a modern built replica of the vickers vimy and it was fantastic um but that uh, is is sort of very similar to this in in that it's you know not at all battered and what have you and very sort of clean and nice modern instruments in the cockpit and stuff like that so i would view this you know when you get in the cockpit as being a kind of a modern replica of the thing rather than an attempt to to kind of uh rep to to make it look like it's some kind of restored vintage airplane i mean you can see that it's got sort of radio equipment in there and it's got a transponder and there's a a gps there and what have you and it's got nav lights on it and stuff like that it's very doubtful uh that a real doran ar1 would have had nav lights on it and certainly wouldn't have had a gps and a transponder on it that's for sure and you'll notice too that the uh the there's been a little bit of attempt to, to sort of make the uh, the instruments look a little bit vintage but of course they are all in English um, and they probably would have been in French on the uh, on the the real thing but I quite I must admit I do actually quite like the cockpit I like all this wood and stuff like that it's got a, it's got a, a little bit of a sort of nod to a vintage feel to it rather than you know uh, trying to look like uh, like the thing really is vintage and I do kind of like that because we are sort of flaying it in uh, in in sort of modern times um so i don't mind that so much you know it's probably not going to be to everyone's uh, everyone's taste but as i say i don't mind it so let's have a look at what we've actually got in the cockpit uh we've got a, a non-functioning pair of sunglasses there that don't really do too much uh, and then what we've got is we've got a, a rudder trim there um you actually don't really need the rudder trim to take off we'll see that when we take off you've got um pitch trim and you can see there that uh, obviously what we can do is we can put that nose up. I do, I do sort of recommend putting a little bit of nose up trim uh, for takeoff. You can use your keyboard shortcuts for that if you want to. Uh, and then what we've got there is we've got a parking brake. Um, notice uh, some of the the uh, instructions on the panel are French. Uh, so we've got that parking brake there. Uh, and then carrying on across uh, what we've got is we've got uh, vacuum suction gauge there and then we've got vertical speed indicator there um, rather optimistically uh, 
uh, of showing sort of climb rates that you're going to be very, very hard pressed to reach in this thing. Uh, temperature gauge there um, for the external temperature. And then what we've got is we've got our mixture control, we've got our throttle control, and then we've got uh, landing lights, which I doubt the real thing uh, ever had. Panel lighting, I don't know, maybe the real thing had panel lighting. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, and then what we've got is the panel lights that you can turn on. Strobe lights, it almost certainly wouldn't have had a strobe light and beacon lights and position lights. Uh, uh, you got a switch for turning the avionics on, which I will switch on uh, since we're going to be using it. You've got an altimeter. You've got the um, comm radio there. Um, compass there. Airspeed indicator, again, rather optimistically marked up to 140. Um, you're going to be hard-pressed to get past 80 on this thing. Flat out, this thing will probably do about 92 miles an hour. Uh, you've got your, your sort of bank angle there and your slip gauge. You've got GPS nav there, uh, where you can turn the GPS on if you want to. Uh, you've got a transponder there, which we'll uh, have a look at when we get the avionics on. You've got an RPM gauge there. Uh, you've got the um, the manifold pressure and fuel flow there, um, so you can mess around with the engine and sort of improve your fuel flow. You've got left fuel gauge, right fuel gauge, voltage and amps there, exhaust gas temperature, oil, um, oil there, and then uh, cylinder head um, temperature. Yeah, so quite a lot of gauges, and I'm assuming that the real thing probably had sort of a very, very similar amount of gauges on it. Um, for the engine and stuff like that, although whether or not they were actually laid out like that is another matter entirely. Um, so then what we've got is we've got uh, open the all fuel valves, so we can put that on, and then you can have the left or the right, so if we're having a look at the fuel, we can uh, click this thing here, and you can see we've got left tank and right tank. Now notice that you've got uh, the ability to put the weight of the pilot and uh, the observer in the back, um, but... Um, it doesn't put models of the pilots um, on the 3D exterior model, which is a bit uh, disappointing, I think. I'm hoping that what they will do is they will patch that, because um, it looks a bit weird without a crew um, flying along. Um, I kind of understand why they've done it, uh, which we'll get to in a minute, but I still think it looks a little bit odd. So we can turn the alternator master on, and then we can turn the left ignition to on, and the right ignition to on, um, now I'm just going to make sure that we've got the mixture control on 100% there and then we should be able to start the thing um, so let's give that a whirl there we go <laughs> I was thinking it wasn't going to start then um, now you will notice that the engine sounds really, really nice. Now, you uh, you heard me mention before that there used to be uh, a replica Vickers Vimy that used to go around air shows a few years ago, um, and it had a very, very similar engine sound to this, if you ever saw that. I'm sure if you go on YouTube, you can probably find videos of the thing taxiing about on the airfields, and it was a very, very similar sound to this. So, I think the sounds on this are pretty good myself. Um, I'll go to the external view, and you'll notice that uh, we are getting 3D sounds on this, so when we come in front of it, we're not getting so much sound as when we come to the side of it, uh, where we're getting the sound that would be coming off the exhaust and through the grills and stuff like that, and if I rev this thing up, you'll notice that you have to be a little bit careful um, because if you've got the brakes on and you rev it up, you could tip it over on its nose. But you can hear that obviously the engine is really, really very nice. Now what I am gonna do is, I'm just gonna put it back on the cockpit view and I will turn the engine sounds down a little bit. Um, I just wanted you to hear those uh, in the sim because I think that they've done quite a nice job of the engine sounds on this. It, um, I, I honestly couldn't tell you what a real Renault engine on this thing would sound like, but I'm basing it um, on having seen that um, Vickers Vimy, which was obviously a World War I bomber, um, at a few air shows, uh, and it, it 
I re recall it having a very, very similar sound to this. Um, and it would have sort of been an engine from a similar era and stuff. So I quite like the sounds on this. Um, but that's really all about I can say about it in terms of accuracy. Now, obviously, what we could do is we can turn GPS nav on, and then we got a GPS screen on there. And you know, quite accessible. You've got you know 3D forward vision, so you've got like synthetic vision on it, and you can go for the map view, and you go for nearest and direct to, and flight plan, and what have you. So you know, if you want to kick in there and find the nearest thing or what have you, you can do that, and it will read flight plans. No autopilot on this. And no cheat autopilot. I've tried it. Um, this is um, manual handling only. Um, now, uh, what we've got here is you've got a transponder, uh, and you can put that in. And then what you've got is you've got enter digit like that, and then you can click, and you go to the next one, and you can click, and you go to the next one, and you can click, and go to the next one. So again. Uh, uh, like like some other uh, airplanes I've reviewed recently, if you've got the insane urge to want to fly this on that sim, you can have a transponder code, and you have got a radio on it. And if we hit the uh, radio panel on there, you can see that that's all lit up. So you're gonna not not have any problem with using ATC if you want to. Now notice some of the gauges have come alive. Now we've got some power. Um, so you know like fuel and pressure gauges and all that kind of stuff are coming on, and vacuum suction. Uh, for, for some of the instruments and what have you and all that lot now and uh, now the real thing probably wouldn't have had um, position lights and nav lights and beacon lights and strobe lights on it and instrument lights and landing lights and what have you and panel lights but um, since it is a review I'll show you what all these things will are like so if we go on here and we turn that to um, that time of day you can see that the panel lighting is actually quite atmospheric I do kind of like that and I think if you turn off that GPS that's kind of nice that I, I, I must admit I do do like the way they've done um, the cockpit light on that at this I think it's really really nicely done now on the exterior view um, you can see that what we've got is very very bright uh, nav lights which I'm very pleased to see uh, and strobe lights now um, I think you know clearly the real thing would not have had strobe lights and nav lights on it and stuff like that. But what we are replicating here is we are, I think, replicating a sort of modern um, sort of air show replica of this aeroplane rather than the restored vintage one. So the fact that it's got nav lights on is pretty cool. You know what I mean? And uh, you know if you want to fly it about in the sim, then that's cool. Like I say, the only the only real sticking point for me on this um, thus far is the fact that there is no crew modelled on the thing, uh, and it looks a bit weird without a crew on it. I'm hoping that um, the developer will patch this um, and stick some crew in there because uh, it, it's kind of like it would kind of be the finishing touch for it. I think. Um, I think it would be uh, it'd look a lot more authentic with a crew in there, even a modern day crew, as opposed to to sort of like seeing nothing in there. Now, um, back in the cockpit, um, you'll recall that I mentioned a nice heat effect. Now, you can probably see that um, against these struts. Can you see the sort of rippling effect of the heat and what have you? Uh, like that and that's uh, you can see it there sort of disappearing down the fuselage and we can see it on the other side because it's the heat coming from the exhaust now if I move the view backwards to the rear cockpit and we have a look there you can see that sort of like blurring it a lot and you can certainly see that rippling effect there against that uh, that um, ground ops guy there and coming back there. I, I, I must admit I really do like the um, the the heat blur effect that they've put on this thing. I think you know it adds a lot to it and I think they've done it really nicely. As far as um, as far as sort of like our model of the plane looks, um, I've not been able to find um, an image of the cockpit of this thing and I'm a bit of a World War One plane fan 
Um, and out of all of the books that um, that I've got on the First World War, um, there are only two. I think no, there's three of my books that mention this airplane, the Doran AR-1. One of them is um, my uh, Jane's Fighting Aircraft of World War One, um, which is a, a really excellent book if you're uh, if you're into First World War stuff. It's largely um, a collection of stuff um, from uh, contemporary reports from the First World War. Um, and that's got a couple of pictures of this aeroplane in it and uh, a couple of blueprint print drawings of the fuselage which I was able to look at and check to see how accurate this this uh, this model was. And exterior model wise, uh, I think it's pretty close in most respects. Um, I've got another sort of encyclopedia of aeroplanes that has one paragraph on this aeroplane, no pictures. And then I think the only other mention that I've got in any of my books on this thing is, uh, I think in Eddie Rickenbacker's autobiography of his first World War service, which is uh, Fighting the Flying Circus, when he's talking about the AEF and the, the sort of crappy cast off planes that they got from the French Air Force before they they started getting better ones and he and he mentions that and that's that's there about the only three books that are, that have got a, a mention of this thing so it is actually quite hard to find some data on this thing I don't know whether there's any of the things in existence in museums and stuff like that if there are they would be in France I would think um, but I honestly don't know but um, as I say from the the pictures that I've been able to to locate and from uh, the blueprints that I've got in Jane's fighting aircraft of World War One, um, I think it's a reasonably accurate model. You can get one or two sort of model kits of this thing, but not mainstream ones. They're usually vac form kits rather than you know your injection molded ones and stuff like that because it's a little bit of an obscure aeroplane. But as I say, quite a nice model. And if they patch it to include some a pilot and a gunner on the thing i think it'll be a really really nice model to fly around because it does fly really nicely um so let's find out about how nicely it flies um by uh, having a go at it so i'll get in the cockpit there and i'll pull the view back a little bit so that you can see um uh, the uh the rudder controls on there and then what i will do is i will release the parking brake um and away we go And you can probably hear that the um, the engine sound is really, really nice. Now, some of you might be looking up at the top left-hand corner of the screen and seeing that I've got what you used to get in FSX and P3D, um, where you could hit Shift-Z and get um, the frame rate and uh, the lat and longitude and the speed and wind direction and stuff like that i all this stuff up here um that's an add-on uh a free add-on that you can get from uh flight sim.to so if you're looking at that and thinking how the hell's al got that um in microsoft flight simulator that's how uh, i'll turn it off so it's not putting us off this thing um on my sim averages when you fly it around over the photogrammetry of Manchester city centre with the graphics on fairly high settings um, never really drops below uh, 30 FPS um, in case you're curious as to how well it does so it, it's you know it's not a frame rate hog let's put it that way so we'll get that thing lined up with the runway Now I'm going to ease off the throttle because as you saw, if you stamp on the brakes on this thing, it will go over on its propeller. So, you know, you can see there, if you're looking at the uh, the brake lever in the cockpit on the left hand side, that I'm stabbing the brake on and off there uh, so that it's not going to tip over on its nose. Now, uh, if you look where I'm waving on the mouse, you can see there the nice effect of, uh, of the smoke, which kind of looks a little bit like the, um, the bracing wire is vibrating. It's not, but it does kind of create that look. 
Um, and, I, and I think that adds a lot to this. Um, it looks like the uh, the bracing wires are, uh, are shaking a little bit. It's a shame that when you look out there, the those wires on the wings aren't, aren't sort of shaking about when you're flying and the, uh, the control wires that you can see up there. It's a shame that those aren't vibrating. But that, that kind of heat blur effect does sort of give you a little bit of that that impression uh, from the edges of there. So it's kind of nice that. Um, now, pretty easy to take off. I will put the view so that you can see the rudder pedals. You do have to give it a little bit of right rudder on takeoff, but not much. So full throttle, I'm gonna get the stick back. Quite slow on acceleration, up comes the tail, and then you have to start correcting it but if you look down at the rudder pedals you see i've not got a massive amount of deflection on them and the thing gets off the deck pretty easy so this thing if you're looking for a vintage airplane to fly um it's fairly easy to take off um note that i did have slightly nose up trim on the thing now then uh, this thing will get in the air at sort of between about 50 and 60. It cruises at about 70 and flat out at about 80, 85. So it is not a fast aeroplane by any stretch of the imagination. But it does fly very nicely. Um, I'm, I'm hands off there. I'll do my regulation. There I am clapping my hands. So you can see the rudder pedals, I've got no input on there, and I'm still hands off on it and what have you. Um, so it will um, fly reasonably okay, hands off. It, it does tend to sort of like roll to the left a little bit as you fly along, but what you actually can do is you can use these left and right uh, fuel and stuff, uh, or you can come up here and what you can do is you can imbalance the fuel to get it to sort of pull to the right a little bit and of course you have got uh, a rudder trim that you could use as well if you wanted to so here we are we should be sort of like just past the aerodrome we can see there we're kind of at the perch if we were going to turn there and we're heading towards Manchester and let's have a look at this thing on the external view um, and there we are a ghost plane with no crew flying it which uh, I do think um, lets it down a little bit um, I, I, I would prefer to see it with some crew in it um, it looks like everyone's bailed out from the thing uh, and it's a shame because uh, you look, if you look at the prop animation this thing looks fantastic it's flying along great and all the control animations are fantastic um, and it looks well in the air it's very very pretty it flies nicely very very photogenic um, and quite an easy plane to fly, you know. No, it, you don't have to give it bootfuls of rudder, and it's you know you can let go of the controls and let it sort of drift along a little bit, and what have you. And the other thing, of course, is that um, with it having that sort of like staggered wing layout, quite a good sort of upwards view on the thing. Not bad view to sort of three quarters down. Not a bad view back. Uh, and so for a biplane, actually quite good for, for viewing stuff. And of course you can go on your external view if you want to. So um, not a bad VFR plane. So if you like your, your kind of historic planes um, and you want something a little bit unusual from uh, from the World War One era, then this is not bad. Um, and as I say, these things... Um, they, they didn't do spectacular in uh, in World War One because they were um, they were sort of fairly quickly um, made up obsolescent by uh, by better aeroplanes. But you know they did all right. You know a lot of them survived through through World War One. I. I mean sometimes you, you you know if you read like World War One books and stuff like that, they give you the impression that you know getting in a two-seater reconnaissance plane was equivalent of signing your death warrant um, uh, and that like they'd always be getting shot down but that's just not true um, 
because these things what what the the pilots generally speaking would do is they would fly backwards and forwards on their own side of the line climbing up to like 17,000 18,000 feet and then what they do is they cross over to the enemy side photograph uh, the enemy trenches or do some sort of artillery spotting work and then after they'd done that they'd head back for their own lines in a dive um, and this thing might only have been able to do about 92 miles an hour but in a dive it probably could have done 120 130 so you know it, it had been able to stay ahead of uh, of anything that was chasing it and if it went over the lines at 18,000 feet um, then you know anything that wanted to shoot it down would have to get up to 18,000 feet as well and not an easy task in a first world war airplane now so the real thing had uh, a service ceiling of about 18,000 feet I have tried flying this up um, to high altitude it takes a very very long time and requires a lot of careful management to get this thing up high um, and the best I could manage before I uh, um, was thinking this is going to take forever was I think I got it up to nearly 12,000 feet um, it was still climbing at that point but only at a very shallow angle and it was teetering on the brink of stalling uh, and what have you I think it probably would have gone higher but I'm not sure whether it would have made it up to 18,000 feet which allegedly the real things could make it up to 18,000 feet uh, that's what the uh, that's what the book figure is anyway um, as you can see not a handful to to get on final approach there i am sort of like you know cheerfully able to to sort of like fly this and roughly line it up off the external view so you know might have to give it a bit of power as you come in but not desperately hard to land so i'll uh, get the power off this thing And then it's just a case of closing the throttle and holding the thing off until it touches down. Oh, there we go. And you can get the tail down and give it some brakes and what have you. So, not a difficult aeroplane to land, um, and not a difficult aeroplane to get in the air either. Um, very lovely engine sounds yeah, I mean you don't need me to tell you that you can hear them um, and that, that, that sort of heat blur effect on it uh, adds a lot to it as well and a, a fairly a fairly useful cockpit as well because you know you've got that like little GPS thing in there and stuff like that so for a vintage aeroplane yes alright it doesn't have a, an autopilot on it or what have you unless uh, unless the developer uh, decides to patch it and, and put an autopilot on there or or you decide to sort of tweak the config file yourself and do it, which I'm sure you probably probably can because it installs into the community folder. Um, and uh, So I, I think it's got a lot to recommend it and if it, if it had the, the, um, the pilots on the exterior model, um, I'd be finding it very, very hard to pick any faults with it you know as I say you know not everyone's going to be in love with the texturing um, but I quite like it because I I view it as you know being a uh, a sort of a modern replica uh, rather than trying to look like a vintage aeroplane um, so some of the some of the paint jobs have this have this uh, this frame for the front uh, front window um, looking like very very shiny sort of polished alloy or polished steel or you know, I don't know chrome metal or what have you um, and you know obviously some of these switches are a bit shiny but you know uh, yeah, maybe they would have been shiny in uh, in in the first world war when they, they, they were first built you know what I mean I mean I wasn't there I don't know um, the you know airplanes uh, that were built around this era they were they tended to be really beautifully built you know with fine sort of craftsmanship and what have you 
and, it, and we do know that these things um, were used until the mid 20s in, uh, in France as training planes and uh, transport planes and for pleasure rides and stuff like that. So clearly they were very well built if they'd been built in 1916 and 1917 and were still around, you know, nearly 10 years later um, after having served in a war, you know, that's uh, that's pretty good going for a, a sort of wooden and canvas uh, aeroplane, I think. Um, so yeah. Um, now, other things about this, I'll just bring it to a halt and try not to not to pitch it over on its nose. Um, so, let's shut the engine off. Now, uh, other things. Um, it's a fairly small download. Um, so it comes down the pipe pretty quickly from uh, from Sim Market. And as I say, it's uh, four to just a little bit over 14 euros. So that's 12 quid or about $16. Uh, so if you're a bit of a First World War fan, that's great that. Um, it's got a nice uh, readme file on all the installation and stuff like that with support and stuff like that, but not much in the way of a manual. Not that you really need much of a manual on this thing um, because it's a fairly simple aeroplane, as you've seen from the cockpit um, and, and the data on it. You can go to uh, you can go to Google, type in uh, Doran AR1, find the wikipedia page um and if it takes you more than three minutes to read that wikipedia page i would be very very surprised because you know there's just not a lot of information out there about these things if you do a search on google you'll find some other stuff on them but even very specialist books like i've i, I mentioned i've got uh jane's fighting aircraft of world war one even those don't go into massive detail about this airplane it's uh you know, one of it's not a sop with camel or a Fokker DR1 or or one of the more well-known planes. Um, it's it's a sort of you know uh, kind of lost lost in uh, in the mists of time aeroplane, but a very very pretty one uh, and quite usable in the sim. You're not going to break any speed records in the thing. Like I say, uh, you'll be lucky to get 90 miles an hour out of this, and generally speaking, it's going to cruise at about 75 um so you know uh slow uh as i say you're not going to make it reach any height records in the thing theoretically eighteen thousand feet service ceiling but i i was struggling to get it over about eleven thousand. um so i think realistically you know probably about eight thousand feet with some fuel on board um but you do get a lot of uh, a lot of nice paint jobs with it with a lot of variety on them um Lots of sort of different looks to the kick cockpit, different looks to the, the, the cowlings, different wood on the propellers and stuff like that. Um, you know, all that kind of stuff. So a lot of a lot of nice variety in the paint jobs and what have you. Um, and of course, obviously, uh, I think people will be having a, having a go at painting it themselves. The night lighting is very cool. If you fancy being a bit adventurous and flying an open cockpit uh, by plane at night because you've got, you know, a GPS if you want to use it. Um, so... The the it, it, now we come to the sort of like the, uh, the the ultimate sort of question that I always ask at the end of reviews like this, which is, do I recommend it or do I not recommend it? Now, um, as I say, I was about to buy this thing um, just just before the developer emailed me. It was quite kind of lucky actually for me, you know, because um, I was literally just about to buy it, and I got an email of the developer going, "When do you want to review this? We'll send you one." And it was like, "Oh, nice one," you know. What I mean? um, so I was actually going to buy it, but I was going to buy it because one, I thought it was unusual; two, I thought it looked kind of nice on the screenshots; uh, three, I'm a bit of a First World War buff; um, and four, I wanted something to do a bit of a different review on and stuff like that. Um, so I had plenty of reasons. Uh, reasons to buy this and uh you, you have to ask yourself when you, you buy plane three flights in would you actually use it um now i think you would use this to be honest because um it's it's lovely to fly about the engine sounds great you know um it's very very pretty looking airplane um and it, it's 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 a nice cockpit to, to to sort of be in if you will um with nice views and that that heat blows blows really cool 
Uh, and it, it's easy to fly. It's very sort of forgiving. I mean, yeah, I could probably have landed it in a much shorter distance than, than I did there. And I wasn't really desperately trying to get it off the ground very quickly. But you probably could have got it, got it off the ground quicker uh, than I did. And, you know, you don't have to sort of go mad with the rudder and all that kind of stuff uh, to be able to land it or fly it or what have you. Um, yeah, so I think... It, my only my only thing about it, my only thing that I'd, I'd, I'd be picky about is it doesn't have an observer and it doesn't have a pilot on the on the exterior view. I think part of the reason that they've done that is so that you know, like you've not got a pilot figure kind of getting in the way um, when you're actually in the cockpit yourself, so you can move back back to the the sort of rear cockpit or what have you. Um, but you know, the, there are solutions to that. You you can have your your pilots appear if you key in a weight you know you can have it so that you um you key in 190 90 pounds there and that's the trigger for a pilot to appear and you, you type zero and then one doesn't appear and what have you um and i i would like to see it so that um so that there were actually pilots on the exterior view now unless i'm missing something and there's some button that you can click or what have you um, where you can show the pilots. But I've not found anything where you can do that. Um, and and it, it, it would be unusual um, for a flight sim add-on to, add -on to not, be, uh, not be showing the pilots when, when you crank the thing up and, and get it going. That is literally the only thing that I can really um, have a bit of a pop at. And of course, once you, once you sat in the thing, yeah, you know, apart from sort of looking behind you and seeing that there's no one in the rear cockpit manning that machine gun, not that it really matters because nobody's going to be shooting at you anyway, then <coughs> I think this is a really very pretty cockpit with all those sort of brass fittings on there and the wood and stuff like that. Um, and that, that heat blur and all those kind of stuff. I think it's it's actually, you know, a nice office to be in, if you will. You know what I mean? I don't know how much it looks like the real thing. Um... And to be honest, I don't care because I love the engine side of the thing and I think it's a sort of pretty aeroplane to sort of tootle about in. Um, and I could see myself um, see myself doing that in this, you know. I mean, if you just sort of wanted to, to potter about around the countryside looking out of the thing, but do it in a vintage aeroplane that wasn't a handful to fly and stuff like that, then then this that's going to offer you both things. You know, something that's nice and easy to fly but it's also an historic aeroplane that that looks kind of nice on screenshots. So for me, if they uh, if they add sort if they patch it and add some some pilots into the cockpit, um, then I would strongly recommend it. Um, but even even without that, do I recommend it? If you're a bit of a World War One buff and you want something uh, that's a slow flyer that's kind of fun. Um, then yes, I do recommend it, and, and it's not that dear anyway. You know, like um, I know I it's it, that's easy for me to say when I got sent a review copy. But as I say, um, I was about to buy it anyway, and it's only twelve quid, so uh, you know it's hardly going to break the bank anyway. Um, and normally, what I do uh, if if anyone gives me a review copy is I throw that money at a charity anyway. So I will be paying twelve quid just not to the not to sim market and the developer. I'll be pay, paying it to the guide dogs to blind for the blind. <laughs> so you know it's it's gonna be easier for me to recommend that. Anyway, uh that's it for uh this review. Um for Chuck's Hanger. Um I like it. I think it's good. Anyway, um take care everybody. That's it from Chuck's Hanger. Um bye.